Well, normally when it comes to a sermon, I tell you to open up to a particular passage that we're focusing on, and my sermon comes from that passage. We've read from three different passages this morning. The first two, Acts 6 and 1 Timothy 3, set before us the qualifications of a deacon. We're going to come back to that later on. Um, But then the parable there of the Good Samaritan in, in Luke chapter 10. I'm not going to ask you to have all three passages open, uh, but you'll try to follow as best as you can. These are passages, I think, during the week and the weeks to come. Go back to them and read over them. We've announced that on the 18th of April, we hope to have an election of one or two deacons. We recognize uh, that we're at a stage in the life of this congregation where our elders are older and less able. We're at a stage where our elders need more support. We're at a stage where we need leadership. And we've been praying for many, many years for leadership. And I think as a congregation, you've got a fairly good idea of what leadership looks like. We're also thankful that over the last couple of years, we have had a new deacon. And we're thankful that the two deacons that we have are biblically qualified for that role, that they work well, and they are excellent deacons. So there's no sense in which we're saying our deacons aren't good enough. They are great. We're thankful for them. But what we want to see is that diaconate strengthened, that we are able, therefore, to serve God in new ways, and also that our elders have that support that they need. You've been given a list of names of all the male communicant members, and I've made clear to you, both in the letter and also in what I've said from the pulpit, that just because a man's name is listed as eligible does not mean he is qualified. A man is eligible if he is a member of this church and not under discipline. Anyone could nominate or vote for such a man. But that does not mean that the man is qualified according to the biblical criteria. And so today we want to consider who is qualified, but we also want to consider what even is the office of a deacon. And in order for us to do that, I want to begin with one point, that Christ is the great deacon. That's the first point. Jesus Christ is the great deacon. Do we want to see what a deacon should be like? Let's begin by looking to Jesus Christ. In Matthew chapter 20 and verse 28, it tells us that the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. And that word serve is the same uh, Greek root as in the word deacon. A deacon is a servant. They minister mercy. Well, here we have Jesus Christ as the great deacon. Although as God, very God, everyone should have fallen on their faces before him in worship. He should have come and been put in the finest of palaces. And every eye should have been directed to him to serve him and give him exactly what he required. Jesus did not come in his first coming to be served. But rather he served. And you can think about what ways that he served. The ultimate way, of course, is giving his life as a ransom for many. What a wonderful thing it is that the servant was a suffering servant. In Isaiah, you've been studying it in the Let's Worship God. Um, You're going to get there to those servant songs where Jesus is clearly portrayed as the suffering servant. He was willing to do that. He was willing to do that to open up the way of salvation. And we read in 2 Corinthians 8 verse 9 in the context of us giving generously and serving those in need it tells us for you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ that though he was rich yet for your sake he became poor so that we through his poverty may become rich. Jesus became physically poor of course But it wasn't so that we could become physically rich. Jesus humbled himself. That was his poverty. He humbled himself 
in this life, in all the miseries of this life, even to the death on the cross, so that we could become rich, that we could be adopted children of the Most High God, that we could have riches in Christ, forgiveness of sin, and all the many blessings that accompany that. And so, as we consider this topic of serving other people, and the office in the church that ministers mercy, let's look to Jesus, who did it so willingly. When Jesus was on this earth, he didn't neglect the poor. In fact, he could be criticized for spending too much time with the poor. Those were the people who flocked to him. Those were the people who saw their need. And Jesus cared for them. And he didn't just care for their souls. He also cared for their bodies. Sometimes we, we make a false dichotomy and we say, well, we're, we're not... We, we need to focus on people's souls. We need to evangelize and focus on these things. And, and that's true in, in one sense that we don't take our bodies immediately with us into heaven. The bodies rest in the grave. They rot away. Uh, and, and the physical things that we need, food and clothing and money, these things don't go with us. We can't take any of them into heaven with us. But Jesus didn't look at people as if they were just souls. He wasn't just concerned about saving their souls. He was also concerned about their bodies and their physical needs. That when people came to him with sicknesses, he was compassionate. He didn't just look at them and say, well, you'll just have to put up with it. He was concerned for people in their misery. And he helped them. And when people were poor, he looked to them. And he helped them. He ministered to them. He provided food for people who were hungry. The most basic thing, a basic need we have, hunger. Jesus, on two occasions, we're told, fed the multitudes. He set us an example. And then remember that on the night in which he was betrayed, he showed himself to be a servant when he got down on his hands and knees and he washed the feet of his disciples. Dirty, stinking feet. They'd been walking. They'd been walking miles that day to come to Jerusalem. And their feet would have been sandy, dusty, dirty. And here was the master on his knees washing their feet. We're told by Jesus there, a servant is not greater than his master. And yet there was the master going on his knees before his servants. So Jesus sets us that great example of being the great deacon. In giving his life as a ransom. Coming not to be served but to serve. But also caring for physical needs. And having an example of humility even before his own servants. The second thing I want us to see today is that in some sense all of us are deacons. In some sense all of us are to do the work of the diaconate. All believers in Jesus Christ are called to show mercy. As I said earlier, the word deacon just literally means servant. And Jesus tells us we are his servants. We're all duty bound, are we not? To love our neighbor. That's part of the law of God. Yes, love God with all your heart, soul, mind and strength. But also love your neighbor as yourself. Ah, but who is my neighbor? We read that, didn't we, in the parable of the Good Samaritan. The man was saying, well, who is my neighbor? He was trying to get out of it, in, in a sense. He, was, he, he, he didn't just accept what Jesus was saying straight away. But once Jesus tells that story that we know so well, Jesus doesn't let the man away with it. He says to him, he drives the point home with a question. Who was the neighbor? Who was the neighbor? Well, it was the man who showed mercy. And it was the man that we wouldn't have expected to show mercy. The one who was neighborly, the one who loved his neighbor as himself, was the one who was outside of Israel, outside of the faith, a different religion, the Samaritan. And Jesus says, you go and do likewise. Jesus doesn't say, well, the deacons need to go and do likewise. He says, you you, all of you who are called upon to love your neighbor as yourself, you go and do likewise. And we can think of that uh, in the positive sense. 
that there are rewards for helping those in need. Giving a cup of cold water to someone who requires it. Jesus tells us you will by no means lose your reward. A cup of cold water. The most simple and basic need. Something that it's easy for us to do. Jesus says that is worthy of reward. We maybe think that uh, rewards are for people who do something extraordinary in the service of Christ. Someone that goes and leaves their country to be a missionary in a far off place. As we were praying for earlier. Those are people who should be rewarded. We maybe have in our minds some of that Roman Catholic idea that there are saints who are very special people. But Jesus teaches us that all who diligently seek him will be rewarded. Those who honour me, I will honour, God says. And even giving a cup of cold water to a disciple is an act that is rewarded by Jesus Friends, in that sense, any one of you can do the role to an extent of the deacon. Not all of you are able to stand up in a pulpit and preach. Not all of you are able to go out in the streets and evangelize. For some of you, the thought of that is a terrifying thought. But every single one of you could give a cup of cold water. And there are rewards for those who do this for the sake of Christ and out of love for him. But on the flip side, for those who refuse to show such mercy, there are consequences. In Matthew chapter 25, Jesus divides uh, people into two camps and he commands one and he rebukes the other. And he rebukes this camp because they didn't minister to him. And they question him and they say this, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked, or sick, or in prison, and did not minister to you. We we didn't see you, Jesus, in need. If we had seen you in need, we would have been there, and we would have helped you. And Jesus says to them, when you did not do it for one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. See, Jesus wasn't physically there, but Jesus' disciples were. His people were there. His people in need. They were hungry. They were thirsty. They needed a visit. They needed someone to go to them and minister to them. And no one came. And Jesus says that these will go away into eternal punishment. But the righteous into eternal life. You see, those who are Christ's disciples will love one another. It's a fact. It's not that some Christians love and some fail to love. If you're a believer, if you're born again, you can't help but love. You must love. It's in your nature, your new nature, to love God's people. And therefore you will help. Now, of course, we can all love to a greater extent. We can learn to love in a better way. But it is in the nature of a believer. And so in some sense, all of those who will go to eternal life will be those who will see the needs of others and will minister to them. Love demonstrates the sincerity of our profession of faith. If someone claims to be a Christian and they have not love, well then we call their whole faith into question. And maybe it's a wee bit uh, of a while ago in our Sabbath evening services when we were considering the book of Amos, Uh, In my mind, it's not that long ago, but if you go back to the book of Amos and the number of occasions that God speaks to his covenant people and he, he, he tells them that judgment is coming because they've trampled on the poor. They've oppressed the widow and the orphan. Many, many occasions. It's a short book of the Bible. I think it's five or six occasions. He confronts God's people because they've been getting rich. They've been thinking about their own uh, physical needs. They've been getting themselves a summer house and a winter house and yet what have they done to the poor? And God says that is not the way you're to behave as my people and you will be judged for it. So the first thing we've seen Jesus is the great deacon but in a second sense we're all to do this work of mercy. We're all to be showing compassion to people around us. 
But then thirdly, I want us to move on to the office of the deacon itself. And that's really where we're going, isn't it, to this deacon election. The office of the deacon is a distinct office in the Church of Christ. And it is one of the standing offices. Uh, a few months ago, we were considering Ephesians chapter 3, and we were thinking, or in chapter 4, we were thinking about the, the gifts that God gives. He's given some uh, to be uh, apostles and prophets and evangelists and so on. These gifts, these offices have been put away. They're, they're not ordinary continuing offices in the church of Christ. The office of a minister we saw continues. But not only that office, also that of the elder and the deacon. In the book of Philippians it begins with addressing the overseers, the elders, and the deacons. Um, and we get qualifications as we've read in 1 Timothy 3 for the elders and for the deacons. It wouldn't be giving us qualifications in this way unless the anticipation was that we would have these offices in the Church of Christ. There are to be deacons in the Church. Now, in the Old Testament, the people that you might have expected to minister mercy were the Levites. This seemed to be the office, the prototype, if you like, of the deacon. And that's why it's so, so interesting in the parable, the irony of it is that there you have a priest and a Levite, both from the same tribe. The, the priests are just subsets of the Levites. And they are people that you would expect to act the part of a deacon. That if they see a need, they would minister to the need. And yet what do they do? Those proto-deacons, if you like, look at the man who is lying bloodied and bruised on the road having been robbed, and they can't get far enough away from him. They despise the man. They don't want to get near him. And they pass by on the other side. They neglect to do their duties as deacons in the church, so to speak. And it's the irony of today. It's the irony of today that the office of deacon is despised. Even in the church Today, many people expect that the government simply will do the work that the deacon is being called to do. Friends, don't have the attitude of thinking that the government is your saviour. Don't have the attitude that the government will solve the problems of those who are poor. It's not actually the government's job to do that. And whilst the government has uh, the ability, because of the, the, the largeness of the state, and the finances that are there. The government has the capacity to do something. To give aid. Yet the government can never do this. It can never give the aid in the name of Christ. And that's what deacons can do. Deacons can give aid to those in need. In the name of Christ. Professor John Murray. Um, he lamented this. He said governmental measures have largely deprived the church of its ministry in the sphere of charity. Regrettably, the church has been willing uh, to have it so and to have this responsibility wrested from its grasp. The church's witness to Christ has been comparatively impaired. Are we, are we really content with that? The government deals with the poor and we just focus on the gospel. I don't think we should be content with that. Nor should we do what many in the liberal mainline church do. And they abandon the gospel, abandon uh, witnessing to just focus on being kind and compassionate to those in need. We don't have to go to either extreme. But we should see that we have a role as the church in ministering mercy. Can I prove that biblically? Well, I can prove that biblically. If you were to think of the most influential men in the church, you'd think of the apostles, wouldn't you? Can you think of any men more influential than James, Peter, and John, and the apostle Paul? And yet, it's interesting, in Galatians 2, we're told that James, Peter, and John, the three most influential apostles in the Jerusalem church, 
They told Paul, when they were commanding him to be a, an apostle to the Gentiles, they told him, make sure to remember the poor. And Paul rejoices. He says, that's the very thing I wanted to do. That is the very thing I was eager to do. Galatians 2, verse 10. And so there you have it. James, Peter, John, and Paul were all eager that the church would officially do something for the poor and those in need. Four of the great men. You think they wrote the vast majority of the New Testament? And so I can say with the authority of the New Testament, from these men's own lips, that we are to remember the poor and the needy. It's not that we abandon the gospel to do that. We do both and. And, and, and that's striking, I think, because in the book of Galatians, the major theme is justification. The major theme is keeping straight that justification is this important doctrine by which the church stands or falls. It's about false teaching. And yet in the midst of a letter about such an important topic, the gospel itself, we have this reminder. Remember the poor. And this is not a new idea that I'm having. Um, we see it in the history of the church in Scotland. At the time of the Reformation, we have two books of discipline that were written uh, as being books to guide the church. Uh, they were founded upon the scripture. The second book of discipline says this, the whole policy of the Kirk consists in three things, in doctrine, discipline, and distribution. Three Ds, doctrine, discipline, and distribution. Could we say I focus most on doctrine, that is in teaching, in preaching. We have the elders, and of course I participate in that at, at session, discipline, that is welcoming members in, uh, counseling them, di discipling them, and if necessary, disciplining them, and then distribution. That's what the deacons focus on, isn't it? Using finances, using the abilities, the skills, the energy that we have to alleviate and to help those in need. What I'm preaching today is not simply my idea. It's not me being tempted to go the way of, of the liberal church. It's what the apostles said. It's what our church fathers have said. And it's what we see in the scripture. Acts chapter 6, as we read there, the deacons are the ones to administer mercy. Deacons are, in fact, the hands of the church in giving out aid. Think about what was happening there. Uh, there, was a, there was a conflict in the church. There were the Jewish Hebrew-speaking Christians, and there were the Greek-speaking Christians. And they're looking and they're thinking, we're being neglected in this daily distribution. There's favoritism going on here. There's not parity. There's not fairness. And so the apostle says, well, we can't have this. We can't have this drama in the church. And we can't invest in this so much that we take on this role of distributing, distributing aid. We, we don't have the capacity for that. If we do that, who's to preach? Who's to pray? Who's to do the, that, that basic fundamental work of the gospel ministry? So what the apostles do is they gather the whole church together and they say, have a deacon election. Choose out for yourself. They picked seven men. We've picked two men or up to two men this time. Um, but that's for the, the leadership to decide. But choose for yourselves, deacons. And when they do, and when those deacons begin that good work of distribution, what happens? We read it there at the end of Acts 6, that reading. There was great blessing, wasn't there? The church grows. The word of God increases. The number of disciples multiply greatly. Deacons never think that your work is just a box ticking exercise or a vain thing. It's so crucial to enabling the ministry of God's word to go further and for the church to grow. Because in Acts 6, we see that the, essentially the ministers and elders were enabled to do the work of ministry. 
They were unable to get on with the things they should be focusing with. And yet nobody was neglected. Because the deacons, out of their merciful hearts, had their eyes open to see needs. So there is to be, there is to be an office of the deacon. Not an office that focuses primarily on money or on fixing buildings, although these things are important, but an office that particularly looks to mercy. An, an o- office that particularly looks to do good to all people, but particularly to the household of faith. But the question is, and this is the question for you as members to work through, who is qualified? And I would encourage you to look at Acts 6 and 1 Timothy 3. It's hard now to keep both of them open. Um, but later on I, I would encourage you to do that. But I'm going to look at both of them side by side. Rather than looking at one and then the other. And I'm going to simply uh, summarize these qualifications. Three different things. First of all, look for men of character. Look for men of character. In Acts 6 it tells us, pick seven men of good repute. And in 1 Timothy 3, deacons likewise must be dignified. These are really the same thing. Think about the men in the list that that came out uh, in the letter from the session. Ask yourself, do I respect this man? Is this man's character worthy of respect? Is this man serious about the faith? Is he serious about living a holy life? Are there obvious ways that the world would reproach him? That the world would say, look, hold on a minute. This man uh, is a terrible person. I'm not thinking of the world criticizing us as Christians. Of course they criticize us. They, They laugh at us for the things that they believe, that we believe. But if the world could say, that man's a thief, that man's a liar. Well, then he's got no business being a deacon. He has a bad witness. Does the man have integrity? And you can test that with some concrete examples. Uh, And it gives us that in the passage in 1 Timothy 3. Test how he speaks. Is he double-tongued? Paul tells us he shouldn't be double-tongued. Does he speak out of the two sides of his mouth? Is he different when he's speaking in front of Christians than when he's speaking with others? Uh, or do you hear things about the, the way he speaks when he's not in a met group, that he speaks in a different way? Um, test not only how he speaks, but test what controls him. Is he self-controlled or is he addicted to wine? Paul tells us that he must not be enslaved by wine. He must not uh, be given to that. He mustn't seek simply his own pleasure in those ways. Nor should he be controlled by greed. Paul talks about dishonest gain. See, it's quite obvious, isn't it? In the work of the deacon, he will be ministering to people perhaps that are addicted, enslaved by alcohol or drugs. Therefore, he himself must not be. He'll be ministering to people who are going through difficult times financially, whether in the church or outside the church, and he'll have to counsel them and help them. Um, He must not himself be greedy. If he's going to be responsible for the use of the finances of the church, he must not himself be greedy, lest uh, he do things with the finances that should not be done. See, people who are double-tongued, enslaved by wine or greedy of dishonest gain are evidently disqualified for the work of the deacon. What we're to ask ourselves is, do I see integrity in this man? Do I consider him dignified, serious about the faith? But then the second qualification, I'm summarizing quite a bit here. Look for men of faith. Look for men of faith. In Acts 6, it tells us that these deacons were to be full of the spirit and of wisdom. 
And in 1 Timothy 3, it tells us they must hold the mystery of the faith with a clear conscience. Now, when it says that they're to hold the mystery of the faith, we're not to think of mystery in the way sometimes people think of it. Something mysterious is something that, that is not known. Esoteric. It's out there. No. The mystery of the faith are, are the things that have been revealed. The things that we have here in black and white. This is the mystery of the faith. Does he hold this with a clear conscience? Is he wise when it comes to the scriptures? There is a difference between the membership voice in this church and the deacon voice. You'll maybe have noticed that inside the order of service somewhere, I don't have it, oh I do have it here. On one side of the sheet you've got the church membership vows. Those of you that are members of the church, these are the vows that you've been taken. And I try to remind you of those every communion season. Because we should be seeking to renew these vows before the Lord. But on the back are the vows that our deacons have taken. They're very similar vows to the vows ministers and elders take. Um, these would be the vows that any man who would be elected and would accept the office, these are the vows that they would take. And you can see that there is a difference between the two sides of the page. You see, it is not simply the case that anyone who is a Christian can be in this office. There's a difference. There's a higher standard expected. They must hold the mystery of the faith with a clear conscience. There can be people who believe the simple gospel that Jesus Christ died and that that is the only way that they can be saved. And they believe it. They believe that Jesus died according to the scriptures. That he was raised on the third day according with the scriptures. And they have reached that level. And in a sense they, they believe enough to become a member of the church. And to come to the Lord's table. But that doesn't mean they're qualified to be deacons. Because it doesn't mean that they're full of the spirit. And of wisdom. Deacons shouldn't just hold the simple gospel and a few little doctrines smattered around. They must sincerely hold the substance of the faith. And I would encourage all the men to seek this, whether you're going to become a deacon or not. I would encourage all of you men to seek to become more mature, to seek to understand the faith, to seek to understand more than the basics more than the ABCs, but to go further and to go deeper. And in a sense, there's the public preaching of God's word. That's one way that you can go deeper. But I think the two uh, biggest ways in which you can seek this sort of understanding is in the Bible class and in the book study. Because in those two settings, it's focusing on the doctrine that this church believes. And seeking to understand that. And I would encourage you men. To take seriously those two opportunities. They're put on for your benefit. For your help. And in both of those opportunities. We'll consider this more this evening. It ties in well with our theme this evening. In both of those places. There's the opportunity to ask questions. And discuss these things. So I would encourage you. Try to seek that maturity. Through these things. But for the congregation. The members of this church. As you're trying to assess who are the men of faith, who are the men that sincerely hold the mystery of faith with a clear conscience, well, listen to their contributions. If you're in a met group with them, listen to the things they say, the, the conversation, uh, the, the contributions they make. Listen to them um, as they pray in the prayer meeting. Listen to the things they talk about after the services. Do you get the sense from the things that they say that they do hold the mystery of the faith. Do you get the sense that they do truly believe. The things uh, that we say we believe. John Calvin says this. It would be exceedingly absurd. To hold a public office in the church. While they are ill informed. In the Christian faith. It just makes sense. To put someone into an office in the church. Where they don't believe the half of it. Or don't understand it is extremely foolish. So look for men 
of character, look for men of faith. And by that, we mean holding sincerely to the faith. But then, thirdly, look for men that lead in their families. Look for men that lead in a godly way in their families. Now, I do want to say at the outset here, I'll, in a sense, underline it in your minds. There is no requirement that a deacon must be married or that the deacon must have children. Okay? What it says here for us in 1 Timothy 3 is really we could summarize it or paraphrase it as if the man has a wife and if the man has children, then this is what he must be like. So you could have someone who is not married, does not have children. They may still be very capable and qualified to be a deacon. But if they do, just as with the elder, they must be a one-woman man. They, they can't be someone uh, who's an adulterer. They can't be someone that is looking at others. One woman. Um, but when, when they have a family, we are to look to their household. How do they run their household? Is the household in good order? As 1 Timothy 3 shows us, particularly we're to look to the wife. And we're to consider, is the wife herself dignified? That's the same word as, as was used earlier for the deacon. The deacon must be dignified. Uh, and we took that as being, he must be worthy of respect, a man of integrity. Well, so too his wife should be dignified, worthy of respect, and a woman of integrity. She must not be a slanderer. And you can understand that if the deacon is helping deal with sensitive matters, helping people who are poor and needy, if the wife comes to hear of it and begins to sp spread that around, you can understand what a disaster that would be for the whole work of the diaconate. She must be sober-minded and she must be faithful in all things. That word faithful um, in all things, faithful is the same word as is used for believing it's never anywhere in the Bible used for a non-Christian. A non-Christian cannot be faithful in all things. And so, as I explained the last time we had a deacon election, it is the position of the session uh, that the deacon, if he has a wife, that she should be a believer. But then if he has children, we're told that the children are to be managed well. Now, no one has perfect children. I don't claim to have perfect children. Um, we know Psalm 51 makes it very clear that we're conceived in sin and brought forth in iniquity. All children are flawed. All children are totally depraved. There is no such thing as an innocent little baby. We are all in Adam by birth and by nature. And so we're not expecting that the deacon, if he has children, that these children will be perfect we're not expecting they're little angels. But what we are expecting is that he deals well with them. That if they do what is wrong, he will speak to them and confront them about that. And rebuke them if necessary. That he will show a real, uh, a real sense of leadership in the family. That he will show the things that are important. That the family comes as a family to public worship. The family as a family read the Bible together. The family, as a family, will serve the Lord. Remember what Joshua said. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Think of what it says in Ephesians 6 verse 4. Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Fathers are not responsible for if their children believe or not in the end. We don't have that power. We would give everything we have, wouldn't we, that our children would be with us in heaven. Absolutely everything. But we are responsible for how we raise them. That we're not to provoke them to anger, but we're to bring them up in the right way. The discipline and the instruction of the Lord. So look for character. Look for a sincere holding of the faith. And look for a sense of leadership in their family, if they have a family. And congregation, let me remind you of this. When we come in a month's time 
uh, to this meeting to elect deacons. All of you who are members of this church, communicant members, will have one vote. And that is a privilege. That is a privilege. That's a, a vote that is yours. And you're accountable before God for how you use it. Um, we encourage everyone to participate in the election. We know that some people won't be able physically to be there. We'll explain more before that time about proxy voting. But I think most people who, who are in that category have used proxy votes before and know very well how it works. But if you can't be there, make sure you have someone that you trust that can act as a proxy for you. Because we want the whole congregation to participate in this important role of picking out deacons. In Acts chapter 6, when the apostles summoned together people to discuss the problem, we note that they assembled the full number of the disciples. The full number. Men and women. All the believers. It wasn't that the apostles said, we'll pick out men that we think. We could do that, couldn't we? Do you trust Ian and George and Sam and myself enough that we could go to our session meeting and pick out men to be deacons? No, that's not the way Christ wants this church run. He wants you as members to cast your vote. Pick out from among yourselves was the instruction given by the apostles. Not that we will do it. You are to do it. In 2 Corinthians chapter 8, from verse 18 and, and, and onwards, it says, uh, this is about the ministering of mercy, a gift given to the churches. It says, with him we are sending the brother who is famous among the churches for his preaching of the gospel. And not only that, but he has been appointed by the churches to travel with us as we carry out this act of grace that is being ministered by us for the glory of the Lord himself and to show our goodwill. That word appointed by the churches in 2 Corinthians 8 is important because at the root of that Greek word is stretching out your hand. It's the idea of a vote. It's the idea that that person who has been uh, chosen to go and take the gift of mercy, that person has been elected by a raising of hands, as it were, from the congregation. That same word is used in Acts 14, verse 23, about electing elders. And so we believe it's a biblical principle that it's the congregation, the membership, that they elect. You elect your minister, you elect your elders, and you elect deacons. And no one can compel you whom to vote for. No one can tell you you must change your vote. This sermon is not designed to strong arm you behind one particular man. I'm not doing that. I don't have a vote. I'm technically not a member of the congregation. I'm a member of Presbytery. I have no vote. It's your choice as God's people to seek. It's a privilege to vote. But it's a responsibility and therefore seek to use it wisely. You know as well as I do, even from uh, my time here as a student many years ago, leadership has been a topic at the forefront of our minds. We've been praying for it. We had a deacon election in 2022 with the ordination in January 2023. One month ago we sent out the letter informing you of our intention one month from this sermon, we will have the election. I believe there is sufficient time for you as God's people to think through these issues, to weigh it all up and to come to some conclusions. But let us endeavor to pray that the Lord would unify us together behind a man or men of his choosing, that God would make his will abundantly clear and that the upshot of it all will be just like in Acts chapter 6, that the word of God will grow and that many disciples will be added to the church. We have plans for this year for evangelism. We have plans for going out to Wishaw. We have a lot of ideas of things we would like to see done. But we need the Lord to bless. 
And one way that we believe he blesses is through the work of excellent deacons coming and doing the work of mercy. So let's make this a matter of earnest prayer before the Lord and may he guide us in these days. Amen.